Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today's video is going to be on acute pancreatitis. This is one of the most commonly asked questions in the pathology exam as well as in the medicine and surgery exams. It is also a very common condition presenting in the ER and doctors should know how to diagnose and manage this condition. In this video, we are going to talk about the definition, pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, investigations and management of this condition. So, acute pancreatitis is non-bacterial inflammatory condition which occurs due to the activation, interstitial liberation and autodigestion of the pancreas presenting as acute abdominal pain. A simple limerick to remember the most important signs and complications of this condition is that acute pancreatitis stings like a scorpion, drinks like a fish, eats like a wolf, burrows like a rodent and kills like a leopard. Please remember that even though it is life-threatening, in the majority of patients, it is mild and self-limited. The mortality rate is less than 1% in mild pancreatitis, but it goes over to 10 to 30% in severe pancreatitis. Coming to the causes of this condition, the causes can be simply remembered by a mnemonic, I get smashed. Most common cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstones, followed by alcohol intake. Other causes are trauma, post-surgery, infections like mumps, coxsackie virus, cytomegalovirus infection or parasitic infections. Autoimmune pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis and connective tissue disorders, metabolic diseases like hypercalcemia and hyperlipidemia, hereditary pancreatitis, post-ERCP and drugs like azathioprine, 6-MP, sulfonamides, estrogens, 5-ASA and anti-HIV medications. If we see the normal functioning of the pancreas, the pancreas is an exocrine as well as endocrine gland. The exocrine function is done with the help of the acinar cells which release enzymes into the pancreatic duct. In acute pancreatitis, there is acinar cell injury which results in release and activation of enzymes like proteases, amylases and lipases resulting in pancreatic inflammation and necrosis. This diagram given in Robin's pathology sums up the complete pathophysiology of AP. AP occurs due to acinar cell injury. This can be due to direct insult to the acinar cells, due to alcohol, drugs, trauma, ischemia or viruses or due to duct obstruction which can occur because of cholelithiasis, chronic alcoholism or ductal concretions. This causes impaired blood flow and ischemia which can damage the acinar cells. Also, alcohol and duct obstruction causes delivery of the proenzymes to the lysosomal compartment, which causes intracellular activation of the enzymes causing acinar cell injury. These activated enzymes can result in interstitial inflammation and edema, proteolysis, fat necrosis and hemorrhage, causing acute pancreatitis. The patient presents with severe upper abdominal pain, which radiates to the back, and this pain is partially relieved on stooping and bending forwards, called as the Mohammedan prayer sign. The patient might also have vomiting and mild fever. Any hematemesis or melina indicates poor prognosis. The severity of acute pancreatitis can be mild, moderate or severe. Mild pancreatitis is when there is no organ failure and no local complications. In moderate AP, there might be local complications or transient organ failure less than 48 hours. In severe acute pancreatitis, there is persistent organ failure which lasts over 48 hours. Please remember that the mortality is 10 to 30% in severe AP and it needs to be managed well. On examination, the patient may be febrile and may have signs of shock like hypotension, cold extremities and feeble pulse. On abdominal examination, there is tenderness in the epigastrium along with upper abdominal guarding and rigidity. The abdomen may be distended and you may see signs of retroperitoneal bleed like Cullen sign, Fox's sign and Gray Turner's sign. Cullen sign is bruising around the umbilicus whereas Turner's sign is bruising along the flanks. In Fox's sign there is bruising over the inguinal area. Also keep on looking for any evidence of respiratory distress. Please remember that serum amylase and lipase are elevated more time more than three times the normal value in acute pancreatitis. 
Of these, lipase is most specific marker because amylase is elevated in a number of other conditions like peptic ulcer disease and mesenteric ischemia. Elevated ALT levels in addition to elevated amylase and lipase help in diagnosis of acute biliary pancreatitis. These patients also have leukocytosis. Other investigations that should be done are LDH, urea and electrolytes, liver biochemistry, triglycerides and ABG analysis. Radiological investigation that are most important in these patients is an abdominal ultrasound, a chest x-ray along with x-ray abdomen and CECT 3 to 5 days after the initial presentation. A plain x-ray of the abdomen will show us colon cutoff sign or sentinel loop sign. In themselves, these signs are non-specific. However, a supine abdomen x-ray may show gallstone and pancreatic calcifications. X-ray chest might show local complications such as pleural effusion and helps us in triaging the patient in the ER effectively. Abdominal ultrasound scan can be done to evaluate the biliary tree and gallbladder and it will diagnose acute pancreatitis. C CECT abdomen is the investigation of choice. However, it should be performed only 3 to 5 days after the initial presentation and hospitalization of the patient. As if done early, it might miss necrosis. ERCP is beneficial in the patients with severe acute biliary pancreatitis and cholangitis. Remember that ERCP here is not a diagnostic tool but rather therapeutic and it should be done within 12 to 24 hours of admission. So here we have a CT scan of a patient on admission. Here we can see that there is abnormal enhancement of the pancreatic parenchyma, which is suggestive of interstitial pancreatitis. After six days, again CECT was done, where we can see evidence of necrosis. Why? Because here there was abnormal enhancement. However, in this, there is non-enhancement, which is consistent with necrosis, especially in the body and neck region here. The same patient came after two months and here when CECT was done, we can see that there is fluid collection, which is consistent with walled off pancreatic necrosis. The revised Atlanta definitions of morphological features of acute pancreatitis have been defined using the CT criteria as interstitial pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, acute fluid collection, pancreatic pseudocyst, acute necrotic collection and walled off necrosis. The severity of acute pancreatitis should be determined in the emergency ward to assist in patient triage, to shift the patient to a regular hospital bed, a step down unit or directly admit the patient to the ICU. On admission of the patient in the emergency, we should look for any risk factors like age over 60 years, obesity or any comorbid disease. There are various scoring systems which help in telling us the severity of the condition at admission or within 24 hours, such as SIRS criteria that is severe inflammatory response syndrome, the Apache 2 score, BUN of over 22 or hematocrit of over 44% and the BICEP score which is most commonly followed in the emergency rooms. In addition to that, other scoring systems are there and after, after the patient has been hospitalized, we should look and monitor the patient for any pancreatic necrosis or organ failure. Of the various criteria that are there to assess prognosis, Ransom criteria is the one which is commonly asked to students. This can be remembered with the help of a simple mnemonic that is G A law and C Hobbes. So if any of the criteria is present, one mark is given and after this all the marks are totaled and based on that a score is given. Based on the score we can tell the mortality of this patient. If the score is more than 6, then the mortality is nearly 100%. So, in Ransom criteria, if the glucose is over 200, age is over 55 years, LDH levels are over 350 units, AST over 250 and WBC count over 16,000 per cubic millimeter 
and the calcium levels are reduced along with the hematocrit drop of over 10%, dyspnea because of PO2 less than 60 mmHg and BUN increase of over 5 mg per day, base deficit of over 4 mL per litre and fluid sequestration of over 6 litres. If, if any of these criteria is present, one point is given and based on the cumulative score, we can tell the mortality and prognosis of the patient. In addition to this, there is another criteria that is modified Glasgow criteria which can be remembered with the help of another mnemonic that is pancreas. If more than three factors are present in 48 hours, that is indicative of severe disease. Other criteria such as the Apache 2 score and the CTSI index are more useful and usually when we send the patient for a contrast enhanced CT scan, in the CT report we get the CTSI that is the CT severity index. This tells us the mortality and morbidity of the patient. On admission, in the emergency, BICEP score is commonly used to triage the patients. In BICEP score, we see the BUN if it is over 25, any impaired mental status, if the patient has severe inflammatory response syndrome, age of the patient is over 60 and if there is any pleural effusion. If any of these points are there, a score is given for every criteria that is met and based on the total score, we can get to know the mortality and morbidity of the patient. In addition to this, please look at the PCV and BUN levels. If the hematocrit is over 44% and the BUN is over 22, they are associated with more severe acute pancreatitis. So here we sum up the most important scoring systems for acute pancreatitis and now I will go on the treatment of this condition. In acute pancreatitis, we need to manage the pain of the patient and dehydration. So initially, the patient is kept as nil per oral and aspiration is done with the help of trial tube. The patient is kept nil per oral for the first one to two days. If there is low hemoglobin, blood transfusion may be done. Monitoring of the patient is done. So we monitor the early pulse, BP and urine output along with daily calcium, glucose, urea and electrolytes, amylase and ABG. Drugs that are given are prophylactic antibiotics and to reduce the pain, we have to give pain medications that is NSAIDs or opiates. To maintain renal perfusion, dopamine may be given. Expiratory laparotomy is not done now, but the indications for surgery are if there is any infected necrosis, pancreatic abscess, or if the diagnosis is in doubt, as in you cannot rule out a perforated viscous, or if there are any complications which are not responding to conservative treatment like massive bleed or cholangitis. Usually, uh, in pancreatitis patients, we do a pancreatic necrosectomy, which is done after four to six weeks. In this, we do surgical debridement of the dead devitalized tissue along with closed continuous irrigation and open packaging. Please remember that expiratory laparotomy is usually not done now in acute pancreatitis. The most important treatment measure is fluid resuscitation and aggressive monitoring of this patient. Usually, Ringer's lactate is given, but normal saline can also be given. The main indicator clinically is the patient should maintain a urine output of more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Fluid input and output are to be monitored constantly. Please put a face mask on the patient or ventilatory support may be given if the patient has any evidence of respiratory distress. After one to two days of nil per oral, early enteral nutrition can be started. Now, a careful history and review of medications Selected lab studies and abdominal ultrasound are recommended in the emergency to assess the etiologies that may impact the acute management. That is why special consideration is done based on the etiology. So if the patient has evidence of ascending cholangitis, he or she should undergo ERCP within 24 to 48 hours. Patients with gallstone pancreatitis should be told that cholecystectomy should be done during the same admission or within four to six weeks of discharge. If there are elevated serum triglycerides, we can do plasmapheresis or initial therapy may include insulin or heparin. If patient has elevated serum calcium, treatment of hyperparathyroidism or malignancy should be done. Autoimmune pancreatitis is responsive to glucocorticoids and if the pancreatitis is post ERCP, then pancreatic duct stenting and rectal endomethacin administration 
is usually very effective. A patient exhibiting signs of clinical deterioration despite aggressive fluid resuscitation and hemodynamic monitoring should be assessed for local complications such as pancreatic neutrosis, pancreatic abscess, pancreatic ascites or pseudocyst. We should also look for any splenic vein thrombosis or fistulas like pancreaticocutaneous pleural fistula or pancreaticocutaneous fistula. Please keep in mind that all the patients should also be monitored for any evidence of respiratory distress because these patients can go into shock, ARDS or there might be DIC. These patients also usually have hyperglycemia, hypocalcemia and hyperlipidemia. Abdominal distension usually occurs because of paralytic ileus and any evidence of GI bleed is indicative of poor prognosis. Renal perfusion should be maintained as these patients can also go into renal failure. So, each and every complication should also be assessed and managed.